Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Royal Society. Science is crucial for understanding the world and for changing the world. That was the attitude of our founders back in the 1660s. They did uh, experiments with air pumps and explosives, etc., and they studied weird things brought back by explorers. But they also were concerned with rebuilding London after the fire, improving the Navy's ships, and practical matters like that. And the same is true today. Science is not only helping us to understand the world, but to change the world today more than ever. But also science is part of our culture. Indeed, it's the only truly global culture. Protons, proteins of Pythagoras are the same in China and Peru. And this evening is a celebration of that broader context, which testifies to our aim at the society in this anniversary year to, as it were, de-ghettoize science and scientists. And as chairman of this evening's proceedings, we could have no one better than Melvin Bragg. In fact, Melvin comes here with applause still ringing in his ears from an event uh, the night before last when the South Bank Show Awards were presented and he got a well-deserved six-minute standing ovation. So after that, this evening's going to be a bit of a come down for you, Melvin. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, uh, but although that may be the case for you, for us, it is a great pleasure and privilege uh, to have you here and it's an occasion, therefore, to thank you for, in fact, all you've done uh, and are doing for the Royal Society and, indeed, for promoting science as part of our culture. So, without any more ado, it's my pleasure to hand over uh, to Melvin to introduce our distinguished panel this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I always feel an intruder, a privileged intruder, when I come into this building, uh, and an amateur, which I certainly am. Uh, the occasion uh, for this event is the launch of this book. It's, it's curiously heavy. Um, at the lift, because it's a beautifully produced book. Um, essays uh, edited by Bill Bryson, and it's tremendous. It's, uh, it's a powerful statement of opinion by uh, about 20, I think, contributors' statement of opinions. Uh, this is one of almost 800 events which are happening this year to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the Royal Society, happening here and um, all over the world, involving most every museum in this country, uh, radio programs, television programs, events like this, this book, and on it goes in New Zealand, in America, in India, wherever it is. It's a, it, the reach of this organisation started by a few gentlemen in not far away in London in 1660 is uh, extraordinary. It's breathtaking, really. Now, what's going to happen is I will talk to the panel, or they will talk, I hope, <laughs> after a little lob of a ball over the net, um, for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then um, we'd like questions or statements or contributions or qualifications, anything that you care to add from the floor. Uh, first of all, the panel. Uh, on my right, near right, is Bill Bryson, of course, editor of this book, um, and the editor of several exceptionally well-written and well-read books, Perhaps uh, relevant here is the uh, most relevant is a short history of nearly everything, uh, especially as it won the Aventis Prize for Science Books and the Descartes Science Communication Prize in 2005. And one of Bill's many gifts, and I think he's such an extremely good writer, is the way he can just get you at the beginning. This is the start of the book, the start of his introduction. I think it's a hell of a sentence. I can tell you at once that my favourite fellow of the Royal Society was the Reverend Thomas Bayes from Tunbridge Wells in Kent, who lived from about 1701 to 1761. He was, by all accounts, a hopeless preacher, but a brilliant mathematician. At some point, it's not certain when, he devised the complex mathematical equation that has come to be known as the Bayes theorem, which looks like this. <laughs> uh, Ian Stewart will say that, describe that in words later on. And then Bill shows how that went underground for an immense number of years and then emerged again. But this man 
came into the Royal Society because of his enthusiasm and his knowledge, and he came out of nowhere to join the Royal Society, and that sets the tone for Bill's essay and for what happens in much of the rest of the book. So we're very lucky to have Bill Brashton here. On my immediate left is the novelist Maggie G, who's used science in her novels and discussed it and talks about it and uh, infused her novels with, 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 with science and the state of the present. And in this essay, the state of a possible future, uh, she explores the idea of an ending. She calls it beyond ending. And she looks at the void with examples from fiction, from science fiction, from uh, books of uh, fact, as they say they are. Uh, it's most informative. And also, the thing which gives it an extra layer is her involvement of her own ideas and of her own work in discussing this subject. So that's uh, Maggie G. and Richard Holmes. Well, Richard Holmes has cornered the market in the romantic movement in this country. He's a brilliant writer, and his works on Shelley and Coleridge are astoundingly good. I remember interviewing you about Shelley in the 1970s. Um, and the two Coleridge books, and most recently, The Age of Wonder, uh, The Life and Works of Scientists of the Romantic Age, Late 18th Century, uh, which won the Royal Society Prize for Science Books in 2009. So we're extremely lucky to have him. And finally, a fellow of the Royal Society on my far right, um, Ian Stewart, a professor in mathematics at Warwick. Um, I've come to know him well over the years when he's helped me out. In fact, just with one tiny question, explained the whole of a mathematical uh, theorem, which I knew absolutely nothing about. But at the end, people think I know something about it. And I, I do swear to you that for a moment I do. <laughs> uh, but the memory goes. He's a writer of science fiction novels and more than 80 books, including From Here to Infinity and Professor Stewart's Cabinet of Mathematical Curiosities. So that's the panel. What we're going to do is I'll ask... Bill, a few questions, if the others want to join in afterwards about what he's had to say, and do the same with the other panellists and have a general discussion here, then turn over to you. So, um, what is it about science and the Royal Society that has excited you enough to do this book? Well, that's a good question. Um, my first contact with the Royal Society was... For, was uh, um, with the Aventus Prize. I mean, when I came here as one of the nominees for the Aventus Prize, that was the first time I'd come in the building. And, and I was, because I won it, I was invited back the following year to be a judge for the, the next year's lot. And, and it was through that that I got to know various people here. And, um, and I was taken down into the basement at, uh, on that occasion and shown the archives and shown uh, Newton's death mask and all these wonderful treasures that they have down there just, just amazing stuff and, and that was really when it became clear to me what a, what a, a remarkable institution this is and, and just, just what it means to be 350 years old I mean it just you accumulate so much in, in, in that time in terms of uh, not just in terms of kind of history but in terms of, of distinction and uh, so that was, that was my, my, my sort of starting point of, of real contact with the Royal Society and uh, and, and then I was invited to, to edit the book, n nominally edit the book. And I do have to say that um, I see John Turney down here in the front row. He's, he's the one who really deserves all the credit. He, he, the, uh, my, my contribution to the editing was a sort of a benign presence in the background. But uh, John did all the real commissioning and, and, and seeing it into print. Um, and, and my real contribution to the book was to write the introduction. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because what, one of the things that beguiled you was the range of people who got into the Royal Society, um, the unexpected range, which we now, like you take the past for granted, of course it happened. But if you set off with the Royal Society, which started, let us say, perhaps in Wadham, but certainly in Gresham, and six, mainly gentlemen, some aristocrats, and, uh, and then within two or three years, people are coming in from all arts and parts, aren't they? Yeah, well, the, one of the great things, and the reason I started with the, the Reverend Thomas Bay is, is that he was a man who had absolutely no pedigree. As a, you know, he was not from privileged classes. He was a nonconformist minister at Tunbridge Wells, and, and yet he was brilliant. And, and that was actually what it took to become a, a fellow in the Royal Society, was, was a scientific distinction. And right from the very outset, that was you know, an important criterion for, for selection to the Royal Society, which is quite remarkable in that age when you think of you know, what it took normally to become 
distinguished, um, you, you know, it, breeding was taken into account. And that didn't, that wasn't the case here. I mean, it didn't count against you at all by any means, but it was, but there were an awful lot of members throughout the early days and, and then right through the whole history of the Royal Society who came from fairly humble backgrounds and distinguished themselves in science, and that's why they were... And the bar was raised quite high because it was a royal society. They got a charter through Moray, who was at the court, who brought Charles over, and Charles was broken. He, he, um, Moray persuaded him that the royal society would make him lots and lots of money, which they totally failed to do. <laughs> um, but they got a, a royal charter, so you were, you were entering something that, that was a, a magnificent organisation, sending in a paper, sending in a thing, and they, these were taken in. I, I think that is one of the wonders of it, that it started like that. Partly the Cresham, the Gresham College idea, the Elizabethan philanthropist, free lectures were given there by these uh, seven professorships that were endowed. So the idea of free access was very strong. Well, I, I, yes, there's that, and I, but I think the, the amazing thing about the Royal Society is that, is that it, it involved all of these people that nobody had any idea that they would be independently famous one day. I mean, Samuel Pepys, I suppose, is the classic example, who, who is, uh, you know... In hindsight, what a great selection for president. But at the time, of course, I mean, he was just a naval official. He wasn't going to be the most famous diarist in history. He thought he was pretty famous. He his name bigger than Newton's on Principia. On that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, uh, and, and there's so many like that. I mean, Fox Talbot was, uh, was, became a fellow of the Royal Society long before he invented photography. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was as if there was this instinct to find these people before they became famous. It was really quite uncanny. But one of the things I like is that people drifted in who must have been terrible. Uh, that Lieutenant Colonel Long, do you remember him? No, I don't. It's in your thing. No, I don't, I don't deny it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Was he, was he one of the ones who slept through me? No, 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 he wasn't the one. He, was, he did the opposite. He never stopped talking. He never stopped asking hundreds of questions. You've got him, have you? You've got him, Richard, have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, there he is. He turned up. He turned up, he said, my brother, and he turned up and he just, and that's great. And they, in, the, in the end, they asked him to stop talking and submit his contributions yes, in writing. Oh, yes, I but the great that. thing I'm by talking. then is that they had writing, and that is one of the most significant things about the Royal Society. Very early on, Oldenburg came in, set up the uh, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, and then really away it went. Yeah, and all, all, in know. 1665, already, they were publishing sort of known worldwide. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really the first, first international scientific journal. It was really the first international scientific institution. It was the, it was the institution that, that came up with the idea of peer review, all, all of those things. I mean, the, all of the fundamentals of, of important sound science were established here a long time ago. And, uh, and then, the, the one thing we haven't really touched on is not only did you have all these amazingly wonderful and often eccentric figures drift through, but you had all these people like Newton and... Christopher Wren and uh, and people that were you know towering giants in in various ways, so uh, it's quite an amazing institution. What do you think? Let's just talk a little bit with the others about the beginnings. What's your view about the beginnings, Maggie? Well, I was just going to say one of the wonderful things about your story of Thomas Bayes, with which Melvin began, is that he didn't apparently think terribly much of his formula, and a friend of his sent it to the Royal Society, who did preserve it just in case, and two years after his death. Um, this formula was published in Philosophical Transactions. So that's a wonderful story that this formula, which apparently is so central to things like radiocarbon dating, well, almost everything, um, was preserved because of the Royal Society, thinking it was worth doing so. Ian, would you like to comment on the significance of of this being in writing, the transactions? Yeah, I think... um, Well, firstly, it means there are records that exist and archives and other such things... Um, but it encouraged people to some extent to think about what they were trying to say and to put it down in some reasonably coherent fashion. And on the other hand, the early issues are this mishmash of observations on strange insects or a funny stone I found when I was out walking. Or So it ranges from these sort of, uh, here is the law of gravity, to, to the, these sort of trivia... Uh, and Will a spider go out of a circle of... Uh, yes, yes, but the Reverend Bayes' formula, of course, looks like it's one of these pieces of trivia, and he obviously thought it was, not even worth sending in. Um, and the verdict of history, and fortunately the verdict of the very astute person who did send it in, um, 
is that this, is, uh, th this gave a completely different way of approaching probability statistics. Um, the University of Warwick, the statistics department, are Bayesians to a man <laughs> um, or woman. Uh, and uh, there are other... You know, you wouldn't think statisticians would have these sort of sets, but uh, they do. And the Bayesians are, are, are a, a sort of major sect in the Church of Statistics, yeah, thanks to the Reverend the, Thomas Bayes. Did you say the Church? <laughs> yes. I mean, we could do an entire evening spending on the influence of the clergy in the Royal Society, mm -hmm. because there are many... But, you, Richard, it's, it's yeah. slightly... I mean, it's 100 years before your period, and I know how careful you are. We all are. <laughs> but when, uh, did this spring... Uh, unusually out of the context of the return of Charles... Yes. Not the return of, of Charles II coming back. I think that's the first very important thing to say. Is, of course, it's a charter. It's got a royal charter, which I think 1664, I think. Uh, or is that the beer? I never forget. Uh, but it has got a royal charter. Indeed, we're looking at the wonderful portrait as you come in. And this establishes a relationship between uh, the ideas of science and government, which are very, very important and still important to this day. The other thing that struck me is there's a great rivalry with the French Academy, Academy. which is founded, I might be possibly a year before, I'm not quite sure about this, um, but it's both rivalry, which goes right certainly through the 18th and 19th century, early 19th century, when the French dominate in a lot of areas of chemistry, but also very important, the notion that science is in fact international and that it should be above warfare and above individual uh, rivalries and so on. And, of course, this is tested often to the breaking point. But I think, again, it's a principle very, very powerful now, the idea that science is a community, it's a global community now, and we can talk across barriers. And I think that is present right at the beginning. Well, they are extraordinary. I mean, they're always the foreign secretary before this country had a foreign secretary. Uh, and people were sending stuff in from Europe as early as about 1662, 1663. It was different from the French, though, because the French were state-controlled. Yeah. The Royal Society was always independent, and that was the difference. It didn't necessarily make it better, but it was a difference. It became quite crucial. Yeah. Can I ask you, before, uh, Bill, before I turn and ask Maggie some questions, you would have said, somebody would have said sitting out, right, Royal Society, let's do a book with lots of scientists writing essays. You have got novelists, you have got... Um, historians, you've mixed it up to my advantage. Now, what set you off on that track? Well, it was, that was, a, it was a very interesting challenge, was how do you encapsulate 350 years of both the history of science and of the Royal Society, um, and how do you do it justice? We, we knew from the outset that we really wanted to have lots of different contributors, um, and, and you know, there's a wide range of very distinguished science writers and others, to choose from. And, and then it was a question of to what extent do we try to make them fit into a, a mold that we're imposing on them? Because we did feel a certain duty to try and cover, you know, to give a 350-year history of the, of, of the Royal Society. But we also realized that these are, these are writers of great distinction, and, and, and they're all very busy people, and they really should be able to write about whatever they want within reason. So essentially what we, we, we asked them was, uh, you know, write about whatever you want, but please bear in mind that, that this is this is overall a history of the Royal Society. And we just kept our fingers crossed that it would somehow all come together, and and it did. I mean, it really did. I think I think uh, I'm absolutely certain of it that that it does actually make a coherent book, which is which you cannot count on because you've got 21 different voices putting feeding in. But I do think it it it, it works very well without, I hope, having constrained any of the contributors. Maggie, Maggie, you and Margaret Atwood are, are from the novelist tendency. Um, how did you approach what? How did you approach your contribution? Um, well, my contribution is about um, how scientists and novelists, playwrights, filmmakers deal with fears of apocalypse, fear of the future, and um, in a sense, I suppose I was a natural choice for that because several of my books from um, The Ice People, Where Are the Snows, um, have been about set in the future and have involved climate change, global warming, that kind of thing, um, nuclear war. Um, and I suppose, obviously, scientists and artists are looking at it in a very different way because scientists have concrete things to do. They can make 
measurements and predictions. They can think of ways to forestall disaster. Whereas novelists and playwrights are looking at, often at the human effects, um, trying to find maybe psychological coping mechanisms, things like that, which seem less useful, but they are part of, part of the picture. I mean, I approach it partly through humour because, of course, fears of the future have changed drastically. And you, when you look at human life, you see, you look, if you're looking in the 19th century, you find people terrified of railways. Um, pollution, explosion, social revolution, it was all coming at us. Um, on the other hand, some fears of the futures have been very well founded. Fear of totalitarianism in the 30s, followed by the Second World War. So fear can be useful, it can make people prepare. And in the case of global warming, of course, there's a great deal of um, argument about exactly how we address this topic and how scientists can address this topic. But because the Royal Society has been very active in, and brave, I think, in dealing with the science of global warming and in doing things like making joint statements with other international science academies, um, I was interested to see why the Royal Society of Literature, which I used to chair, why we did nothing and um, why writers are in a different position, really, when they're looking at um, fears of global warming. You're, you're very comprehensive in your quoting of sources in your piece. Do you have the impression that more novelists these days, rough and ready, I mean, it's anecdotal, isn't it? Mm. More of them are, are, are going in, into science for their subjects and thinking about it in that way? I think very few, curiously. I've always thought there are very few political novels in this country. There's been very little literary fiction addressing global warming. This is always very annoying for science fiction writers because they've been talking about that kind of disaster for, for years. It's old hat to them, but literary fiction has stayed away from it, and I speculate that this is because we're a bit too keen on irony, comedy, and quoting, and a little nervous about information, uh, debate, being a bit more serious. I think literary fiction tends to shy away from from big topics, British literary fiction, perhaps. Um, we don't want to be a bore, we don't want to preach, whereas scientists can say they're doing their job. Um, yes. You can also say that the, the, the people who've written uh, factual, non-fiction books about science have, have done it very comprehensively well. And, yes, and very you, good. You're rather daunted, writing. really. It's mm -hmm. as if you're thinking of uh, playing um, tennis and then you happen to have a knock-up with Murray and you decide you'll probably play another game. <laughs> well, I don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not talking about you. I mean, I'm just talking about you said that m most people shy away from it. It's, uh... I, I think it's part of the British disease, though, of uh, irony, actually. I, I really do. Uh, I, I, um, yeah, I, I think it's just not possible, in a way, for... I mean, I don't know what Richard feels about this, but I just think we do have, we, we do have a difficulty about... Being serious in a way, and serious in a certainly in a public way, I, I think it's a bit problematic. Richard, what's your comment on? What might well, you um, interesting point about irony, but just generally for a minute on fiction. If you start going back, um, one of the first books I ever read when coming to London was by J. G. Ballard, oh, yeah. and that that body of Ballard's work, extraordinary really, um, which, which is both a sort of speculative but uh, approaches uh, science in a particular way. He's very unusual in being, of course, accepted by both the science fiction and the literary fiction communities. Yeah, I mean, it, the Drowned World is a wonderful book. And his education, of course, was it was it was both in flying and in medicine as well. Indeed. But uh, it seems to me, um, yes, inspired by. I, th I th actually think we're in a in a sort of golden age of popular science writing now, both here and in America. I think the last fifteen years, very, something remarkable that's happened. But I also think that novelists are beginning to write about this. Giles Foden's Turbulence, very interesting novel based on the idea of how do you forecast the weather in the week before D-Day. Very, and the whole notion of probability and how do you bring science down to a very specific human problem. Do we put the people in the boats or not? And we go to the science of weather prediction. Very interesting novel about that. We had, it's in the past, though, uh, isn't it? Tracy Chevalier said um, even further in the past, but she was up yeah. here only um, just before Christmas talking to Richard Forte 
about Mary Anning, the paleontologist, woman paleontologist down in the West Country, um, and the difficulties she had um, in being accepted. Very interesting there because there's an American biography of her by Shelley Emling. So it's very interesting to see a fiction writer uh, and a biographer doing it. So all I'm saying quickly is I do think this is changing, probably inspired by the real quality of popular science writing now. You must be. What's your reaction to this, Ian? Because you write science fiction, and so do a great number of other people, and these books have roared away over the last 100 or 120 years. Let's take Jules Verne and Wells as starting points, and it's been a huge, uh, huge success story, good science fiction. And so this talk... The, the, what's I your was, take on what's been said well, so far? I, I, I was encouraged when Maggie acknowledged that Ballard has his roots both in mm, science fiction and in literature because there are a lot of people who have decided that science fiction is basically Star Wars and Star Trek, and that's it. Um, and anyone who actually wrote good science fiction, you start to look at Ballard, Kurt Vonnegut, Ursula Le Guin, who keeps standing up and saying, I'm a science fiction writer, even if they say I'm not, Philip K. Dick, um, and so on. You can list these names. Uh, a lot of the literary fraternity go into denial and say, no, no, they didn't write science fiction, because it hasn't got spaceships, it hasn't got um, talking squids in space, I think is the mm -hmm. phrase here. Um, but it never did. It was always very diverse and Ballard is an example. Um, I've just um, Neil Stevenson has written a remarkable series of books. Some of them are hardcore science fiction. He has a it's really a six-volume series combined together into three thick volumes, The Baroque Cycle, which is set round about the time of the founding of the Royal Society. Um, and it has a, has a suitably manic Isaac Newton character. Um, it has a, a version of the... Um, uh, well, the MIT, basically. There is the Mass Massachusetts Institute of the Technological Arts, I think it's called, and so on. And he weaves fact and fiction together to the point that you simply cannot distinguish. There's a completely imaginary country that one of the main characters comes from. And then the next minute, it's, it's London of that period, and it is absolutely perfect. I think it's wonderful people can do this. Bill, what do you think about the, the area of science fiction? Is it, I mean, this is a, a ridiculous generalisation, but might set something off. Do you think there's a slight worry that it's always doomed? I mean, the, the basis of science fiction is it's in the future and it's going to be terrible. I don't know. I, 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 I regret to say I, d I don't know enough about science fiction really to, to, to answer that question. The, I, I was just thinking as we were talking about this, um, the, the last science fiction books I read were when I was in high school. I read Kurt Vonnegut. I, re I think I read everything by Kurt Vonnegut then. And, and it wasn't that I lost interest in science fiction. I just, you know, my reading moved off in different directions. So I don't really know anything at all about science fiction writing. I'm Kurt sorry to Vonnegut say. Kurt Vonnegut is another brilliant example though, of somebody who's both a really serious and wonderful literary writer and who does address these mainstream science issues because, in fact, his brother was a scientist. Mm. So it's a choice. It's an aesthetic, imaginative choice, partly, whether you want to involve yourself with science and to me if I didn't involve myself with science I think I'd be losing half, half the world so to me it's an obvious choice yeah, I think there are some very optimistic science fiction novels actually the Kim Stanley Robinson Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars the titles pretty much tell you it's terraforming so Mars. those pencils you got when you were a kid. When yeah, you that's right. You could press and get a different... <laughs> you start with Mars as it is today, a desolate place. Do you start to convert desolate it for human habitation? An optimist, right. and you get that's green. the cheerful one, is it? You end up with oceans. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to... Um, you, you have to be sort of willing to believe that uh, having oceans on Mars and, uh, and totally destroying the uh, current version of Mars is, is a good thing to do. Um, and there's lots of politics and there's lots of nasty things happen, but, but ultimately that's a very positive series of books. In terms of the bringing things together, which is being touched on very uh, strongly by uh, Maggie and, and to a certain extent by um, Ian, the area that uh, you're dealing with, Richard, uh, with, um, let's just take Coleridge and Davy and all, that is a t time when the um, confluence it's very striking. I mean, Coleridge, just take Coleridge and Davy, for, yeah. start with them, and, and Davy and Wordsworth if you want. But, but at the very highest level, these people are interchanging ideas to mutual benefit. 
Um, uh, is that, was that, what circumstances produced that? Do you think that was a one-off or what? No, I, I mean, certainly true. That's how I began because Coleridge's great friendship with the young 21-year-old Humphrey Davy just up from Cornwall. And, uh, You've gone to Bristol to work in a lab in th Bristol. That's you? right, in, yeah. in the Bristol Pneumatic Institute, which was a very early form of, of a sort of public pro bono research institute, basically looking at gases, whether they could heal lung diseases, basically tuberculosis, not such a crazy idea. Uh, and uh, young Davy set up a first very early series of, of experiments with blind tests as well, inhaling various gases and then ordinary air, and the subjects didn't know what they were inhaling. And he particularly began to work on nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas as in dentists. And um, he had a series of volunteers, and amazingly, the, 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 the roll call of volunteers is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, straight from his opium experiments, can you imagine? And the accounts of this... He thought it was bliss. The, the, um, actually, he was, in fact, he, his, uh, Coleridge's own accounts are quite scientific, uh, and they're quite sort of cool, surprisingly. Robert Southey, also. Uh, Roger, Paul Roger, who wrote Roger's Thesaurus. And the thing I always remember about his notes is he said he couldn't find words to describe the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow this is good. So, um, that's, why, that's why I wrote the Thesaurus. <laughs> that's it. So that, that was a kind of just a beginning. I remember giving a, a paper here called Courage Among the Scientists, which was, which was an alarming experience for me and probably for them. Um, and then from that, um, yes, I, I began to see that um, with people, for instance, take the wonderful astronomer, observational astronomer William Herschel and his sister Caroline. Again, a very important story there, women in science, very important part here. And there that you have young Shelley with his own telescope and reading the papers, Herschel's papers, and then drawing certain very angry philosophic conclusions, which uh, Professor Dawkins would approve of, that, that the big universe that Herschel discovered had no room for a creator in it. And he, uh, Shelley puts that in notes to his poem, Queen Mab. So I began to see uh, that there were very, very interesting connections. Whether these went up, I think they do go into the Victorian period, indeed, something I'm going to look at. But um, that made, it also did another thing, that it allowed me to write about the lives of the scientists, as well as the work they did. Because there are, Davies Laboratory notebooks are also full of poems. They also have the love notes that young women in his lecture hall used to send to him, mostly rhyming. Um, so things like Caroline Herschel's own um, day book, which is extraordinary, giving a, a wonderful, as it were, day-by-day -day account, including, of course, the finding of Uranus, the seventh planet, but also as Herschel begins to see the possibility of galaxies outside the Milky Way, and suddenly the universe begins to look very different. So you could get inside the lives of scientists. What impact, I was, you know, what effect did this have on their religious beliefs, their philosophy, their home life? Davy's marriage, Humphrey Davy's marriage, was wrecked by his science because he insisted on doing the experiments for the miners' safety lamp throughout Christmas, <laughs> and Lady Davy was not amused. A very, very interesting thing. Incidentally, a lot to be said for Lady Davy, actually. Again, a very, very interesting account. A lot to be said for her. Yeah. Oh, she was horrible to Faraday. That also is very interesting. The three, <laughs> the three of them go on a tour. I know we were talking about international science. <laughs> Davy gets permission to go in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars to collect the Prix <coughs> Napoleon in Paris. At the Times writes a thunderous leader saying it's outrageous that he should go and collect a prize from the enemy. But there's this other, the examiner, the liberal newspaper, is saying, but this is the proof that science is actually above this. It's so a it's a very, very interesting question. Lady Davy was aboard there. She was very good at that moment in Paris. Mm. But the idea of the, the, the fellows looking after each other goes right through. In when Franklin, who's over here as a diplomat, failed and this is, uh, he tried to stop the colonies, the American colonies breaking away from him, and he failed to do that. When he went back to America, he wrote a letter to the captains of all mm. the ships, all the ships on the line in America, telling them, instructing them, because he was not to attack the ships of Captain 
a cook or anybody on an expedition from the Royal Society to leave them alone because they were about work for the Royal Society, and they obeyed that. Yeah. Right. And the French, the French, of course, as you know, passed on their nuclear stuff to the Royal Society before they passed on to the government. Franklin was then ambassador in Paris, and in the balloon thing, which I write about, very interesting, a kind of technological race there, Franklin is sending secret papers back here to Joseph Banks, um, and they're very amusing, his papers, about the possibility of ballooning. Uh, one of them is he points out to Banks that uh, if you had um, 10,000 balloons, each with Two 10 months. men in it was you could invade across the channel. And he leaves the question open, which way would the wind be blowing? <laughs> uh, anyway, that, that's, that's actually some great thing. ideas. It says you brought right balloons actually, to stagecoaches, heavy stagecoaches, yes. so you wouldn't need six horses, you could just do two. And the, the invasion idea was very prescient in a way because he saw the military application yes. of, of, of flight. And that was, although the way of doing it was absurd... The actual idea yes. of invasion was a very bright one. And that's yeah. perhaps the la last thing to say about that. W one of the things I'm fascinated by is how difficult it is to conceive. For instance, take the notion of flight. We think it's obvious what it can be used for. It was not obvious to them. Banks's idea was you could harness it to... A, a, Erasmus Darwin produced this wonderful formula for a wheelbarrow mm. which had a hydrogen balloon attached, which would half the manual labour up the hill. Uh, and there are a whole series of that. Franklin, last shot here. Franklin produced a series of brilliant ideas, one of which was this. Harness a hydrogen balloon to a footman who will then be able to run at high speed across country and serve drinks to the other end of the estate. <laughs> and they're all teasing, teasing ways of making you think about this new concept of flight. But they were, they, they were onto it. I, Banks was... Banks, you, you prove it. I've just, I'm talking from your essay that Banks gave the impression of being the French are up to their, their frivolities, having balloons yes. and all yeah. that. But he took it... Once he worked out, or this lot worked out at this end in London, that you couldn't actually steer a balloon. You couldn't make it do what you wanted it to do. Therefore, it couldn't be of any serious military use. He moved on. He just thought, let the French waste their time. We'll do something else. Yes. Ian, um, as the FRS... You're, in your essay, you, choose, you write about mathematics, of course, um, but you choose to direct our attention to the way that mathematics, as it were, is the hidden support of most of society, hidden even to many um, capable scientists and, and uh, technicians themselves. Yes, I mean, it's something that I tend to bang on about a bit these days, but uh, mathematicians do. They, it's dawned on them that the rest of the world has, hasn't got a clue what mathematicians actually do, but they think they know. And it's something like school sums, and it's not entirely what we do at all. Um, and they've got the idea that because nobody ever tells them that maths is involved in anything that they encounter in their lives, that means it's not, and therefore it's completely useless and pointless. And, and since they don't like doing it at school, then if it's useless and pointless, that really means that they should never have been asked to do it, and they really would have preferred it if they hadn't been. Um, and... Actually, it's not like that. I, one of my books, I say, if, if we had a little red label, like the Intel inside label that goes on computers, and it said mathematics inside, and you stuck it on everything that depended upon mathematics, then the world would be covered in red stickers. What about this room? Then? So in this room, OK, um, the projector at the back producing the... Uh, the nice picture here, there's a whole pile of mathematics just goes into actually making that work. The, even the, the lights that are illuminating the stage, design of the lenses, Bill's glasses, um, the clothes we're wearing, the textiles. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this is not just random stuff. Industrial processes have to work. When you say work. depends on mathematics, could you explain a bit more what you mean? OK, let, let's take... Uh, there's some... Um, <coughs> I'm from the, the room, it's I, fun. One, yeah, well, one of the examples I do in my chapter um, is when you go on holiday, Avril and I go on holiday, we go to Egypt, places like that, we take now huge numbers of digital photographs. You get your camera out and you click at everything. You, you, you stop worrying about whether you're taking 17 photos of the same thing. You want one that will come out. Um, and inside it is a little card about the size of a postage stamp. And there are... I mean, my camera will take a bit 
1,800 very good quality pictures on this card. And the first thing you think is, well, you know, this, this is clever engineers and the, uh, those cards must contain a huge amount of information. And they do, but they don't contain enough information to store a couple of hundred photographs of the quality you're actually producing, let alone ten times that. So how do you squeeze all those photos into this little card? And the answer turns out to be that the engineers are even cleverer than you think. They can't just build these wonderful gadgets with lots of memory. They know how to transform the information so that you can squeeze it in. They can compress the data. Um, and this is the standard one, is the JPEG encoding system. Or you have the JPEG files, um, Joint Photographic Experts Group, who sorted out how to do this. And... I didn't actually know how it was done until I was writing this chapter, and I thought, I wonder how they do it. And it's about four or five different mathematical techniques applied in turn to the data. Um, a very important one goes right back to Joseph Fourier, who was a foreign member of the Royal Society, French, um, who wrote a fantastic paper about the mathematics of heat and how heat moved through uh, a solid body. Um, and this journal was rejected, this paper was rejected by one of the journals because it wasn't rigorous enough, so he wrote it up as a book instead. And then he ended up as the president of the French Academy, and, and then he was on the editorial board of the journal, and then he published the whole thing in the journal anyway <laughs> <laughs> to get his own back. But it's about decomposing complicated shapes into regular waves of various sizes. And JPEG starts by decomposing a picture into kind of checkerboard patterns, which are really waves that go in opposite directions. And it is mathematically a straightforward step beyond what Fourier was doing, but it's used for photography, not why, heat. Why do you make a point, and I'd like the others to respond to this as well, please, but then we can draw this part to a close and ask you to join in. Why do you, you make it quite clear in your piece that you think it's... Um, it's very important that people realise the omnipresence of mathematics in the world in which we live. And it might be quite... I'm using the word dangerous. You might think that's too strong a word. It might be quite dangerous, or there'll be unexpected uh, and uh, rather um, uh, uh, disagreeable consequences if people didn't pull themselves together and, and, and understand that mathematics was that central. Yeah, I think if it was the case that you could... Take a six-year-old child and say, well, he's going to be a professional footballer, she's going to be a ballet dancer, whatever. You could take those children and say, well, they need to know enough basic maths to get by, but they don't really need to do anything else. But, of course, you can't do that. And we have a society which, in fact, rests on massive amounts of mathematics and mathematical underpinnings, and although... None of us need to know how the JPEG system works to use our digital camera. The engineers who are involved in this, all of the people in the uh, camera manufacture and that kind of thing, and there's a lot of them if you start counting them up, they've got to know how to do this stuff. And if we don't educate the next generation, then the next lot of fancy gadgets will never happen. Um, so I think society has a kind of vested interest, which it doesn't understand it's got, in educating enough people, basically in educating everybody in mathematics, partly because some of that's going to be directly useful to them, but mostly because unless you do that, you, it, it, you don't build your way up to the, the, the experts who are actually going to do it in their job. Do you feel, so, sorry, mate, I'll, I'll just go on the panel. Do you feel that, the, that there's a danger if people don't know enough about science? Yeah, there's, I mean, science, science is the most important thing there is out there. See, um, I mean, it's, it is the one thing that's going to answer all the questions that are still unanswered. And, uh, you know, we really need science and mathematics and, and all, all the other aspects of it to do these things for us. I mean, I just had a, a kind of arresting experience of this that... that uh, my daughter was taken into hospital a couple of weeks ago with abdominal pains, and, and uh, they, they didn't know what it was. And uh, uh, what I discovered from a doctor who talked about it is that 30% of all gastrointestinal problems that, that result in hospitalization 
remain undiagnosed always. They don't know what it is. They generally resolve themselves. But I just that is amazing. I mean, you, you just think that, that a third of all people who go into hospital with, with abdominal, with bellyache, that's serious enough to go into hospital, you know, medical science cannot say what it is. That, that, clearly, science has, the, has, has got to answer those kinds of things. I mean, there's millions of things in just in our everyday life, little things like that that are comparatively trivial, and then questions like, you know, how are we going to cope with global warming and all of that? And, and all of those things, the answers are going to come from science. Okay. Well, one of the points that Ian makes is that it's not just the public who don't know enough about science, sometimes other scientists don't know enough mm. about science because he tells a story of the, um, with reference to the 2004 Mars rover landings um, and interviewing some of those scientists. And they said, uh, when questioned as to what maths they were using, we don't do any of that. We don't use any um, abstract algebra. <laughs> so there's a, perhaps there's a kind of narrowness that we have certainly have in the arts, in science as well. Yes, and the point was that they did actually they did. use They it. did, of course. Yes. They did. Um, in their information processing of the data but they, they were sending back. But they didn't know they were doing it. They didn't it. know they were doing it. It had no. been farmed out to another company, which had half a dozen people who really know how, knew how to do this stuff. They'd turn it into a chip. The chip had gone into the rover. All the... the um, JPL engineers knew was there was this chip in the rover that sent the signals. Well, some, sometimes, of course, it can be wonderful not to know the equations, but just to read the accounts, in, as in W.D. Hamilton's work, where he writes beautifully explaining his theorems, and then you see the mathematics set there. Maybe you can't do that. So, so science communication is tremendously important, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a broad brush question, Richard. What do you feel about this, about the way that science is, reaches people? in this country? Do you think mm. we're, it, it's, it's doing a good job of explaining itself? Do you think the media is doing a good job of helping to explain itself? Helping you, to explain it, sorry? I think, yeah, for a start, I think ma mathematics actually is the most terrifying thing for most people. It's, it's the block that prevents you. There is this famous story that uh, Stephen Hawking was told by his publisher, for every line of algebra he put in, he'd lose 10,000 readers. That's in a short history, you know, well, every of time. time I play modern music, I lose 10,000 viewers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's some it, publisher. <laughs> that, so th there is a problem with mathematics. I, I must say, in, in St. Ian's uh, essay, it's a wonderful essay, not only JPEGs, but the sat-nav mm -hmm. is explained, and the maths of the sat-nav, in a way that I sat down and then rang you up, Maggie, and said, I understand this. So, so th there is... I, a, I'm coming, uh, I'm on my side. We all raged about the JPEGs. Yeah. None of us had understood JPEGs yeah. before. So. so I do think, yes, there, I think we're in a, at a time when people are and should be keen to understand. I think it's a, so almost citizenly duty. And if I could extend this, I also think that um, the history of science is being taught more in... Uh, Simon Schaefer, who is uh, a contributor to this book, has done a series of wonderful programs on television. And also, incidentally, it was tremendously good, I thought, on your program about the, the history of the Royal Society. Right, yeah. So I, I do think that the history of science is becoming much more open. And one more point is, uh, and this is more of a personal point, but I do think the biography of scientists is now becoming more and more interesting. Uh, the, a current bestseller is the Graham Farmer, the uh, Dirac book, The Strangest Man. Uh, and I would pick out one other one, which is uh, uh, Georgina Ferry's book about Dorothy Hodgkin, the, the crystallographer. Who, uh, and just one thing first to say... First woman fellow. F first woman fellow, Nobel Prize. Um, and it's not only the Eureka experience, but she spent, I think it was 30 years, solving the molecular structure of insulin. And she did it, completed it, in her 90th year. And that gives you an, a completely different idea of what science is about. And that biography can do that very, very well. you want a final word before we get to the audience? Yeah, well, I'm, it's not exactly germane to what we've been talking about, but it's a great opportunity for me to say thank you. Because, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about the authors, and we drew up a, a wish list of the people that we wanted to have contribute to the book. And with... With one or two exceptions, everybody we, we approached agreed to do it. So the people that we've got in the book are the people we really wanted in the book. And these are every one of them. Uh, these are all people of great distinction and who have very, very busy lives, and they gave up you know, a, a good chunk of part of one year in order to write a contribution to this book and to make it what it is. And, uh, and just on behalf of those of us who are on the production side of things, I just wanted to say thank you to every one of them. Thank you. Would the, anybody, would you like to come in? 
Yes, there. And there's a microphone somewhere. Yeah, it's printed. If the next person wants to speak and put up their microphone, then we can... I'm put up their hands. <laughs> uh, being too busy today. Then we can... Anyway. I'm going to start by thanking Richard because I'm Georgina Ferry and I'm very grateful to you for mentioning my book. I'm also a contributor uh, to the book. I wrote about Dorothy and Kathleen Lonsdale and some of the other pioneers of, of X-ray crystallography. But the point I'd like to make is that we've, we've had a wonderfully enjoyable evening this evening looking back at the very early days of the Royal Society and going on through the 19th and 20th century and also looking forward to the future through the kind of thing that Maggie's been talking about in her fiction. Um, but what concerns me, as I, I've written mostly about 20th century scientists, and you've mentioned, you've all talked about the importance of archives, uh, and uh, Richard's uh, it very engagingly talked about uh, Caroline Herschel's day books and so on, these written records of the people who, who became the scientists that we now look back and see as famous great scientists. But at the time, they may not have known they were going to be those famous scientists. The Royal Society did a great job of discovering these young people, often, again, as, as Richard said, before they were famous. But what are we doing today to make sure that people who are those young scientists today um, give us some kind of record of the future? So that in, what I want to ask, really, is in 100 years' time, when the history of the 21st century, of 21st century science is being written, how will we know who the important figures were and what they did, other than from their published scientific papers? Now, obviously, those are going to be out, but you get a very dry history from nothing but the scientific papers, which are a, a kind of artifact, really, of the way science works. And the personal papers, the letters, the diaries, which were such a big feature of people in the past, are ceasing to exist because everybody generates things electronically, and they don't keep them anymore. Um, besides the fact that the thing has got so much bigger now, the Royal Society did a wonderful job of pulling everybody in. It was a centre for correspondence for the whole world. And, and science is now much more diverse. And you can't keep track of all that correspondence anymore. So I've said quite enough. But my, my, my question is really about who, who will write the history of today's science in the future? And how will they get their information? Ian, would you like to briefly tackle yes. that first? <laughs> I mean, I'd just like to say one thing before he tackles it. The idea of how does anybody know they're going to be any good in the future, I, don't think, I think very few people, except sort of Newton, uh, know that. It just look at the, 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 the way this book starts, with uh, Bill's striking first two pages. A wonderful vicar. He didn't uh, have a clue that he was going to be discussed by by Bill and everybody else in 2010 in the Royal Society building. So I think that knowing that you have a future significance is given to very few people, and some of those are of doubtful <laughs> provenance, really, when you come to think of it. Right, Ian, what would you say? I think there, there, there's another aspect which makes it even worse, which is the sheer quantity of stuff. Uh, historians of mathematics have pretty much shied away from trying to write the history of the maths of the 20th century, which we aren't even in now. Um, because the subject exploded, and to get a, a comprehensive view is almost impossible. But, I mean, your, your point is to do with where are the diaries, where are the notes, where are the, the, all the things that make the history interesting. Um, at the moment, if we're lucky, they're floating around on somebody's archives of somebody's website. Because, I mean, nothing you put on the web, even if you try to make it disappear... It's still there somewhere. Somebody's copied it. Someone's done something with it. It's around. The problem is finding it. Um, my, my, my original web page, which uh, I stopped maintaining about five or six years ago, is still on there somewhere because AOL never got rid of it. It's still sitting on the server. Um, and there was one development which could point a way forward, and maybe this problem will be resolved in its own way. There, there is a... Um, a growing movement for scientists to have kind of online recorded discussions of their problems. There's a mathematical one where um, anyone can join in, anyone can contribute, anyone can say, hang on, what do you mean by such and such a concept? Please define that more carefully. I don't think that's right, and so on. And um, one or two quite important problems have been solved by these groups of a 1,000 mathematicians and the odd, um, you know, amateur from, from outside who just wants to join in, and the record of their discussions is actually available. It's impossible to publish these things because nobody knows who did it. 
you know, who actually put the final piece into the, the last bit of the proof of the theorem? And does that count anyway? Because it depends on all the other bits. We'll have to go to other questions. I think. Anybody else? Yes, here. There. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to, to follow on from that and, and think a bit about the future. You, you described yourself, Melbourne, as, as an amateur, and I suspect from reading the books that actually, Bill, you would have described yourself as, as an amateur, and you talked early on about the, 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 the breadth of people who were involved in the Royal Society and how many of them had no pedigree, either, uh, either a pedigree in science but came up through science. And I would like to ask you all about how you see the role of the amateur going forward in science, particularly in an age where information is available in the way that we've talked about, um, but, but in a sense with, with the, with the industrialization of large chunks of science, both from an economic viewpoint um, and, uh, and from the technical requirements, whether the role of the amateur is in, is, is in doing science or in, or in the discussion of science and communication of science. I, I'd just like to get your view on that. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's a, that's a really tough question, I don't, I, and I don't know. It's, it's, the, it's my first answer. But I suppose the, you know, one of the most important roles of the amateur, in, in generally speaking, is to make sure that science is considered important enough to support. And, and I think one of the roles that scientists have are people who, who are interested in science is to make sure that just, you know, the, the average person on the street is, is appreciates science or appreciates mathematics or appreciates all these things. So because you know, unless you have the, the public behind you, it's, it's going to be hard to get some of these things done and achieved. In terms of actual input by amateurs, I, I'm not sure I understand the question because I, I, I can't imagine how uh, and, and, you know, amateurs... Science has got so complicated and so complex in most ways that, that except very peripherally, I don't know how any, anybody who's not trained to a field could really contribute to it. Mike, would you like to but I, I could be missing your point entirely, I'm sorry. I would say I think we can be curious and eager to learn and interested. We can not be narrow. Um, we can enjoy the... There's such brilliant popular science communication going on, I think, and we can, we can read what's there for us, what's been put there for us. Um, and perhaps we can also have a go at judging the internal logic of things... We can sometimes look at metaphors that we might not quite like, like stewardship of the earth, and say, hang on, is that really what human beings are doing? So we can also have that critical view linguistically. We can also float ideas. We can do thought experiments. I mean, Martin writes generously about, in sometimes science fiction has floated ideas that have become serious prospects, like rocket technology, for example. So we can do all those things. I think not close our eyes and appreciate what's there, I mean, I think, you know, science has great beauty, even for the amateur. Yeah, as part of that, in the question of records in the future, I do think the information technology is so changed now with the emails, blogs, photographic records, sound records. It's going to be... There's no problem about the records, as far as I can see. Over the uh, amateur status, it's very interesting. It seems to me there are some careers... career of James Lovelock, very, very interesting, professional scientist, but he goes off as a maverick and comes back with, with a very new reading, of course, the whole Gaia theory and so on. Not an amateur. Um, his background is professional, but he, he breaks away, as far as I can see. But Independent. Not an um, astronomy. Very inter- I mean, what's happening in cosmology at the moment is probably one of the fastest moving areas, most exciting. And I happen to know that the uh, amateur astronomical groups are all over the country and using amazingly sophisticated equipment. And, of course, making original observations that even the big obs- observatories are not picking out. It's only one example. But I do, I do think this is very, very live. I, I'm just, I'd like to move to the next question, but as you're, it's the gentleman there, near the back. I think that there's a moral and political dimension to science, uh, which is very strong. And I think that us amateurs uh, have a good uh, opportunity to join in those discussions. Uh, obviously informed by as much science as we can get hold of. But I think in that sense, science belongs to non-scientists as well as to scientists. Because increasingly, as it takes over more of the world, it raises all sorts of questions about society, morality, politics, and so on. And these are general discussions. They cannot be exclusive to one elite. It doesn't work. 
up there. So it's not a question, it's actually a comment on the answer to the previous question. I think the problem is that we often think of science as the big science that we're all talking about, that the professionals do in teams, etc. And there's a lot of, if you like, little science that people can do. And I think Maggie hit that. It's about being curious. And we do that starting with the young. And we train them and help them to see that science is about being curious. And we can all, if you like, discover something that nobody else has discovered. And that builds the pyramid, I think, that Ian re mentioned earlier. Another question? There's, there's somebody on this side. Can you just keep, if you keep a hand, maybe they can get a mic to you in advance and we don't have to wait all the time. Uh, just taking that point a little further, I think one of the things that you notice in research and development, for example, is that most companies n no longer can simply create products on their own. And there are a lot of open source projects where companies are farming out to what could be classed as amateurs to start adding value to some of the propositions that they're trying to generate. Um, I know Intel do this, Lego recently uh, actually have projects where they now accept contributions from people designing bricks uh, and different parts for their, their tools, one of which was actually a micro engine. Now the person was undoubtedly not an amateur who made it, but he basically just submitted it for nothing so that they could evolve their abilities to create projects and products. And I think that this kind of open source element means you do end up with a situation where somebody may be uh, not a professional scientist but has enough education and mathematical background, for example, to help create what would be called a scientific endeavour. Um, who, who next? Anybody else? Pardon me? I can't see. Yes, there's a hand there, yeah. Just by way of an example uh, of amateurs in their involvement, um, Mary Anning uh, got mentioned as a, a pioneering uh, amateur paleontologist. Um, paleontology in this country, uh, at least invertebrate paleontology, it depends almost entirely on amateurs making spectacular discoveries. In America, where there's vast amounts of funding for expeditions and you can go off with a big team of professionals and discover dinosaurs, that's, uh, that's great. But in this country, most dinosaur discoveries have been made by amateurs, not just back in the 1800s with Mary Anning and the Reverend Fox on the Isle of Wight, but just a couple of years ago on the Isle of Wight by a seven-year-old schoolboy who discovered a new species of pterodactyl. Uh, you're wanting to get in again? Yeah, I, yeah. But I, 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 I did just want to say I was really pleased with that got to because I do see the open source movement in its grander sense um, as being very uh, as being being one of the things that's happening here. And the examples that we were given there, yes, cosmology and uh, and astronomy, yes, paleontology. It's happening now in the way that the public is being asked to contribute towards our monitoring of, of ecology and climate change, but in other ways, actually the, 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 the industrialization of science has commoditized it to a level where people, and you may not describe them as amateurs, but what they're doing is amateur science. So I, so I, know, of, I, I know of a group of people who, yes, were all molecular biologists, but have moved on and become, become uh, you know, business people, etc who all have uh, fully functioning molecular biology labs at, at, uh, at home. And I know of a move to try and gain the publication in Nature that has the largest number of individuals, each with their home address, and know, uh, <laughs> which they are prepared to take on with a 20-year objective. But that is fun science um, in a sort of open source way, which has only become possible by the sharing and the analysis of the large amount of data that's out there. So it's a move away from data to a move towards interpretation, move back towards hypothesis, a move away from different elements of the scientific method that I think is very interesting and could bring large chunks of the, uh, of the community from the amateur side back in. Thank you. There's somebody at the back. That's right. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Uh, I think we ought to mention the citizen science uh, programs. These are usually online. The one that I'm most familiar with is Galaxy Zoo, where some professional scientists have an outrageous amount of data which no way they can handle themselves, and they enlist the public, public with computers, to go online and help with the data analysis. This is a huge and very rapidly growing movement. Uh, in the Oxford example that I know, they had an ambition to get 50,000 people helping after a year. 
They had it in 24 hours. Well, I never thought I'd receive a question from, just, from Jocelyn Bell Burnell. My goodness. It's, uh, it's quite an evening. <laughs> One more question, and then we'll come back and ask for final comments, which is the, most, the worst part of it, really, from you four. Brisk final comments. Be conclusive. Be incisive. Uh, one more question while they prepare. They're not going to give you any chance to prepare by the look of this. Okay, if we start with uh, start with you, in. Final comment. No, just a final comment, yes. Okay. Um, I think when popularising science, there is one problem which is very difficult to avoid, um, which is that science is actually a method for avoiding believing things because you want them to be true. It is deliberately going against the natural human uh, instinct to say, ah, I know what's going on. And so this gives it this inhuman feel. If you do science rigorously, you are questioning things, and people don't actually like that, especially if what gets questioned is something they happen to deeply believe in. And a lot of the, the big controversies at the moment are really related to this point. Uh, I don't have a good answer to how you deal with that, but it is an aspect of science which, um, when you're popularising it, to some extent you often try and slide around it and just avoid confronting this, this irreducible aspect of science, that it is not the natural human way to think in many ways. Uh, and I, I think it's important to bear that in mind. It's a difficult subject for that reason. Richard. Felix qui potuit rerum cognoscere causas. That was written over the front of my college. It took me years to work out what it meant. <laughs> it's actually Virgil, and it means happy is he or she who can know the causes or origins of things. And that seems to me a wonderful thing for a scientist, but also for a biographer. I've been inspired by that. Maggie? Um, well, this book tells us a lot about the history of science, but it also takes us into the future and tells us about the present. And I think I'd like to give the final word um, to Martin Rees, uh, to his part of his um, epilogue, because it excites me very much as a writer, so I hope it will excite you. He imagines aliens um, watching Earth and seeing how much has happened to it in a, t a very, very short space of time. Um, within 50 years little more than a hundredth of a millionth of the Earth's age, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere began to rise anomalously fast. The planet became an intense emitter of radio waves, the total output from all TVs, cell phone and radar transmission. And something else unprecedented happened. Small projectiles launched from the planet's surface and escaped the biosphere completely. Some journeyed to the moon and planets. Could these aliens have predicted the unprecedented fever less than halfway through the Earth's life. If they continue to keep watch, what might these hypothetical aliens witness in the next hundred years? Will a runaway spasm be followed by silence? And he says the outcome's up to us. I... It, it, it always occurs to me, you know, you started off by saying that um, you, you always feel... A, a, I can't remember what word you use. I always feel fraudulent when I come into these Don't things. The and, uh, but because, you know, it's, it's, I, in a position like this, you're, you know, you, you, we're sitting up here, and I'm, I'm answering questions, where is in fact what I do for a living is I ask questions. And, uh, and it always makes me uncomfortable to be, to be answered. So I'd rather, I'd rather finish by asking a question, if I may. And, and it's a serious question. I wanted to ask Ian, just because you're here and because, well, because of, of what you do. I, I remember reading Nature's Numbers some years ago, and, and I thought, this is a fantastic book. I don't know why I was so, so bored and lost with mathematics when I was in school. And, and you know, reading your book and many other books by scientists, eminent, eminent science writers, made me feel the same way at different times. So I really wanted to ask you, why is it that, that when science is so demonstrably important to each one of us and so obviously fascinating, and, and, and we all are all fascinated with the answers and what science can do for us. Why do, why do people persist in feeling that science is boring? I honestly don't know. The, um, 
it would be easy and I think completely unfair and wrong to say it's because it's not being taught right because that sounds like you're blaming the teachers and actually the teachers are doing um, a pretty good job often under very difficult circumstances but um, it's often I mean my, my educational friends say you know children start out with this enormous desire to learn and to know and and they love maths and they love shapes and they love little scientific experiments and things and somewhere this childlike approach to the world gets lost and I think scientists to some extent even though they often seem terribly terribly serious and so on um, have managed to preserve some of that approach to the world I, I, I have a very good biologist friend who when he was 50 was given a badge and it said if I haven't grown up by the time I'm 50, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, something is, is killing it off. Killing it off? Well, that's a good ending, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell they write science fiction. <laughs> well, Jocelyn, can you say the last word, please? <laughs> is there a microphone up that end? Thank you to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for turning up and thank you to the panel and good night.